want to sing, blessed be your name. And so we, we love you, God. We thank you for uh, all that you're doing here in our midst. We pray uh, that you'd fill us with your spirit now, that you would prepare us to study your word, that you'd give us insight and understanding, that you would help us to grow uh, by your word. Lord, we, we really ask that your word would have its work tonight, uh, whether we need encouragement or correction, uh, whatever it is, Lord, would you speak to us tonight? Uh, fill me with your spirit, Lord, please help me to speak your words. I don't want to speak my own. I just want to speak yours. So go before us in Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right. Good evening. Go ahead and have a seat. The youth are going to make their way uh, down the hall. A um, couple little announcements. We had a a wonderful family camp. Uh, we were at the uh, Temecula KOA for a couple days, and it was a ton of fun. I think uh, I tried to count how many folks we had out there. I think it was like, I think it was going to be like 19 uh, families, and then uh, I think uh, one of them didn't make it, and but this one came up for the day. So um, I think it was like just about 70 people. And, you know, you had all the different kids running around, riding bikes, and it was just a, a really good time. So it might be something we look uh, to do again next year. So kind of be on the lookout. I feel just a little, is it too close to my mouth here? Darn. I don't know. I, maybe that'll be better. I'll whisper. We'll try that. You can just chase me with the slider there. Um, a couple other things. Harvest Festival is coming up. Again, it's one of our biggest, bigger outreaches. And so if you, I think everyone has signed up or a lot of people have signed up to help out. Um, next Tuesday, uh, I'll probably be calling everyone to let them know how we're going to set up and how all that's going to work. And so just be ready for uh, for that. It's going to be a good time. And then um, if you still want to make candy donations, the bucket is out there to donate candy. Um, if you want to help with setup, uh, we'll be here at about 12 o'clock to start setting up. It starts at three, but usually we have like 30 or 40 like straw bales to move around and, and to kind of get decorated and that kind of stuff. So if you want to come as early as 12, come set up at 12. Or uh, I think we had mentioned to everyone, uh, Pastor Dan, uh, the one who passed away from Mexico, his memorial service will be at Calvary Chapel Downey that same day at 11. So if you're like, I'd rather go there and then I'll just jam up here or just stay down. You could stay down there too and hang out. That's cool too. But if you, but if you want to be there, it'll be at Calvary Chapel Downey um, at 11 o'clock there on the 26th. And then uh, men's retreat. Men, if you haven't signed up for the men's retreat, please come join us. We're gonna have a great time fellowshipping together. We're gonna have a great time um, just, you know, sitting under some good teaching uh, together. And so um, it's, on the, it's on the Calvary Apple Valley website. You could sign up through there. And uh, it is quite, it is an investment. It is, a, it's, you know, it's not cheap. Uh, but it is a good investment. So uh, just prayerfully consider going. Um, I think at this point, you might not get the size shirt you want if you sign up, but uh, the shirt is kind of just, you know, the, it's the icing on the cake. So if you get, you know, if it's not your size, maybe it becomes a good rag towel for, for something, you know. I don't know. But, uh, but, you know, get ready to go to the men's retreat. Okay. Tonight, we're going to continue on in the book of Numbers. We're going to be in chapter 12. Uh, we'll do a quick run through on what we've studied so far. Chapter one, we saw the nation preparing for war and they were numbered. That's uh, why it's called the book of Numbers, right? That we see there's 603,000 men of war. That's how we've gotten the number that there's about two to three million people. In chapters two through four, we see uh, the way they camp, uh, how they were going to kind of the layout of the, of the camp. We saw the workforce, uh, uh, which was the family of Levi, the tribe of Levi. We saw um, in chapter Chapter five, uh, a section of personal uh, and, and holiness as kind of a nation. We saw that they put out those who had leprosy. Now that the, the, the camp lines were drawn, there was a place to send the leper and that's outside the camp. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, we saw uh, the, the issue with confession and restitution when sin had been made towards another. We saw the law of jealousy about an unfaithful wife. In chapter six, we saw more in regards to holiness about but this time, not about uh, uh, putting, you know, this bad stuff away, but just drawing closer to God in the Nazarite vow. Uh, we saw that. 
uh, chapter 7, we saw the 12 days of offering where each tribe brought an offering to the Lord, uh, you know, in thanksgiving uh, with that, with the, you know, the peace offering. And we saw them give a sin offering and a burnt offering and all the stuff they gave uh, to the Lord there. In chapters 8 and 9, we saw the cleansing and the dedication of the Levites. We had saw the dedication of the priest, Aaron's family back in Leviticus, but now we see the whole uh, tribe of Levi who was set apart to do their work, right? Some of them were going to carry parts of the tabernacle. Some of them were going to carry the holy things. So they had to be consecrated for uh, that work that they were going to do. We saw the second Passover uh, celebrated and the listening for God's voice. Do you remember when, when they go, well, what if some people missed the Passover? What if they were unclean on the day of the Passover? Or what if this was going on and God gave specific instruction as they sought to hear his voice. And then chapter 10, we saw the departure from Sinai. And then last week in chapter 11, we watched the people begin just after starting the journey, just after starting the journey, they begin to do what? Complain. They begin to complain. And what was the complaint? They said, we had it better in Egypt. There was better food there right? And they said, all we have here is this stinking manna. That's all we have here. We eat the same thing every day and we want meat to eat. Now, God had not made a prohibition on them eating meat. They could have slaughtered their own animals if they really wanted to have, you know, a hamburger that night. But instead they just thought it's easier to complain against the Lord and not do anything ourselves. And so we'll just complain against God because over there, there was so much flavor, you know, the leeks, the onions, the garlic, all the wonderful stuff that we had uh, back in Egypt, forgetting very quickly that they were slaves in Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt, but they forget that. And so you remember the complaint got so intense that Moses had asked the Lord to kill him because of the severity of the complaints. He said, Lord, just kill me now. He's like, why have you put this burden on me? Why have you asked me to carry these people? I'm not their mother. You know, I did not, I, I have not begotten them. And, um, and the Lord tells Moses that he's going to help, first of all, by filling 70 men with his spirit to help lead the nation. So Moses is going to get some help. Then God, God promised that he is going to indeed give people meat to eat. And Moses wonders how God would do that. And if you remember last chapter, uh, God says something very wonderful in, uh, in verse 23. He says, has the Lord's arm been shortened? God says, Moses, it's so funny that people are complaining because um, they don't have what they want. And now you're crying and you don't think I could do what I say, but I can do what I say and I will do what I'm going to say. And so we see that the Lord sends the quail and he even says, you're not going to eat it for one day, two days, five days. You're going to eat it for a month until it comes out of your noses. Right. And, uh, but then we saw what happened that as soon as the quail was there and the people collected all this stuff and they're, you know, just, just, just gorging themselves. It says while it was still in their teeth, man, uh, that people eat and, eat and the Lord sends a plague. And it was a pretty sobering chapter because we talked about how we can be complainers right? How we can complain. And the complaint usually isn't just about the thing that's happening. The complaint is usually something more along the lines of, we don't always say it, but, but it is this, Lord, I don't like what you're doing. Lord, I don't trust you. Lord, I don't like what you have said we have to do here instead of just trusting who he is. And so today we're going to get into something that's kind of along those same lines, slightly different, but it has to do with a discontentment in the Lord, but this time not from the people, it's in the leadership. And so let's read Numbers chapter 12. We'll read through the whole thing. It's only 16 verses. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, I said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud, stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. He said, hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Uh, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak to him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. A and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Verse 9. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them and he departed. 
When the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly, in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when it comes out of its mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O oh God, I pray. Verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed for seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people moved from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. (laughs) So (laughs) those first three verses, we see a lot happening. We see it's Miriam uh, and Aaron that are speaking against Moses because of this woman that he had married. It says uh, that then they question you know, has the Lord indeed spoken through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? So, so Miriam and Aaron, you remember, are siblings of Moses. We met them way back early in the book of Exodus. Miriam and Aaron are older. She was the one, you remember, who watched Moses be put into the river. Do you remember that? When all the kids are supposed to be thrown into the river, uh, Moses' mom, you know, makes the little basket and, and, and puts the, uh, you know, the what was it? Asphalt and pitch in there, right? And so that it would be buoyant and it'd be a little boat, you know? And I think of, um, I think of that little book we read to our uh, kids when they were little. It's like uh, Moses in the, baby Moses in the boat or something like that. And his mom set afloat or something like that. Yeah, it's got a little rhyme so that the kids would remember what it is. Uh, but anyway, he puts him in there and Miriam, the sister, is the one who's watching there in the reeds to see what would happen. And then the little boat goes and then he's crying. And then Pharaoh's daughter who comes to, to take a bath in the river sees that picks him up and, and all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, this is a baby. He's going to die out here. And, and Miriam's the one that goes, uh, do you want me to find someone who can nurse that baby for you? And, and yeah, 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 do that. So, so you know, gets reunited. So we, we met Miriam a long time ago, early in the book of Exodus. Also, we saw her in chapter 15 of Exodus. She's called a prophetess and she sings a song in praise of the Lord for his deliverance. Now, Aaron, we've met him as well. He's the older brother who's been very active been very active so far in the nation that, that it went, you remember when Moses is complaining to the Lord going, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go to Pharaoh. And after all, you know, most of the complaints, he's like, I can't even speak well. I can't even speak well. What am I supposed to do? He goes, well, here comes Aaron. Aaron will be your mouthpiece. He knows how to talk. So Aaron got to be right there whenever Moses went to speak to Pharaoh, that Aaron's the one that spoke the word. So he saw all the wonderful things that God was doing. God was saying it would go through Moses and Aaron would get to speak. And Moses and Aaron got to see some really incredible things being uh, the mouthpiece. One of the first things we see once they come out of Egypt that we see in Aaron is a really great thing when the, when the children of Israel are fighting the Amalekites and Moses goes up on the mountain to pray and he has to hold his arms up in that posture of prayer and in prayer. And as he's doing it, it says whenever his arms would come down, the Amalekites would prevail. But as his arms stayed up, the children of Israel would prevail. Joshua down fighting the battle. But the prayer happening up on the hill. And what do we see in Aaron and a guy named Hur is they hold up Moses' arms in prayer. So that's a wonderful thing. And we see Moses as a, or, or Aaron as a big help there. But, but then just a few chapters later, you remember Moses up on the mountain and the people come to Aaron because he leaves Aaron in charge. And the people go, what happened to this Moses fellow? You know, what, well, we give, a, give us something. He goes, okay, give me all your gold. So they give him all the gold and he fashions a golden calf and he brings down, he goes, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Let's worship it. And so they start worshiping it. And then they start getting really crazy and the people become unrestrained. Sounds like, you know, it's actually a pretty, you know, debaucherous party that's happening here. And, and the people become unrestrained. It gets to a point that Aaron can't even control them anymore. And Moses and Joshua up on the mountain go, what did, what did you remember what Joshua said? He goes, is there war in the camp? And Moses goes, that ain't the sound of war. Those are people partying right now. And it's not good. And so they come down. It's a whole thing. And he calls uh, uh, Aaron out, Moses does. And he says, what did they do to you that you would let this happen? He goes, I don't even know. You know, they gave me their gold. I threw the gold in the fire. The calf came out. And you go, what? Come on, Aaron. That couldn't be. So it seems that Aaron 
has this flaw as a leader that he's only as good as the people around him or the influences he's listening to. And there's a good lesson for us in there in any type of leadership you're in, whether, it, whether it's large scale leadership at work or in a church or ministry or children's ministry class or in our families, wherever we might be leaders, that we have to be careful of the influences or the things that we let here, that let ourselves hear. Um, and most importantly, that we hear God first. And we honor God more than anything else. And we listen to his voice more than anything else because there will be other voices. There will be other people that say, you should do this. And you go, uh, okay, because I don't want to get people mad. Okay, I'll do it. And it's like, uh uh-uh, that's going to be a bad deal. If all the people get a say in what we're going to do, you know, again, I I don't know how many people are in here, but I always say, if if you got 20 people, you're going to get like 60 different opinions because each person will have a few. And, and if you follow all of those, you're going to be doing this all over the place. And Moses or Aaron seems to be that guy. Now, according to a guy named Alan, Miriam seems to be the lead in the criticism here. And, and it's because in the original language, the feminine singular verb that initiates the chapter and the placement of her name before that of Aaron indicate that Miriam is the principal in the attack against Moses here. Some speculate, and this might be over speculation, that Miriam could have been frustrated or mad or hurt that she wasn't among the 70 that were chosen last chapter to help govern the people and be filled with the spirit, even though she was back in Exodus, we were told that she's a prophetess. We don't know if that's true or not, but it says that they bring this complaint. They speak against Moses. And so this is brother and sister here. Brother and sister start talking amongst themselves about about their brother Moses, who's in charge. So last chapter, we had the complaints that were just the people, right? The people were mad. Started with the mixed multitude, if you remember. And all these people got mad and all of a sudden they got worked up going, we want meat to eat. We had it better in Egypt. This is different. This is from the leadership. And now Moses would probably expect when the people complain to go, well, they're the people, they're fickle. Even maybe some of the 70 elders, maybe they're going to get a little frustrated here and there. The the heads of the father's houses, maybe they don't like things all the time. But this one's kind of, I think it kind of blindsides, right? Because who is it? It's his brother and sister. They know who he is. They know, I mean, Miriam of all people should have known that God had a plan for this kid's life. No doubt she saw as a little girl how many babies were thrown in that river and died, right? Right? And she saw that one of them was saved, right? And so she should have known there's something special about Moses. And especially then when he comes back to lead the people and all this stuff, and here she is, she's in the midst of it. But she has a complaint and it it starts out here. It says that they had a complaint because of the Ethiopian woman whom Moses had married. This is the reason for their criticism. Well, it's the first thing they're going to get mad about. The criticism is greater than this. It's, It's actually a bigger deal than this. So... What does that mean? We, we could have sworn we knew Moses already had a wife. Remember when he had escaped Egypt, um, he, he sees um, Zipporah there at the well and, and there's this whole thing there. So uh, I'm going to read a few different things here. Some regard this as a problem passage because in Exodus chapter two, it says that, uh, that the wife of Moses was Zipporah and, and she was the daughter of a man from Midian, not Ethiopia. Some think that Zipporah had died, and this is the second wife of, uh, that Moses has taken after her. Uh, this is the second wife Moses took, and he took her after his first wife's death. So you can remember that Moses is uh, living a pretty long time here. He's at the very least 81 right now, and it's certainly possible he survived more than one wife. Others think that Moses took a second wife in addition to to Zipporah, which wouldn't be uh, the craziest thing in the world. There, there, there was definitely polygamy at this time. Uh, but, and this is possible, but it doesn't seem likely. Most don't think that this is likely. Uh, others suggest that Jethro, Zipporah's father, was actually from Ethiopia, had eventually moved to Midian, making Zipporah an Ethiopian by birth, but she had lived in Midian. And that's kind of where most people uh, start falling is, or, 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 you know, agreeing, is that like this probably isn't 
isn't a new wife. It probably isn't a second wife. This is, uh, it's the same wife. And if you remember, Zipporah kind of had an issue back in uh, early Exodus. Do you remember about the circumcision? That it seemed like she wasn't totally on board with it. And God makes her because he subdues Moses. You remember uh, in the camp, the angel of the Lord is ready to kill Moses because he hadn't circumcised his kids. If you weren't here for those studies way back in Exodus, you're going, this is weird right now. It is a little bit, but it's not at the same time. So, but you remember, that, that he makes Zipporah circumcise the two boys and, and it says that she like kind of gets all mad. She's like, you're a husband of blood to me. And then she's kind of not there for a while. It seems that when Moses goes to do all this deliverance stuff, she goes back and stays with dad and then they reunite later. And so some people believe, some commentators believe that, that she never really bought into all this stuff. She didn't necessarily want her husband to be the deliverer. Uh, he, she didn't want him to do this much ministry. Um, and that could be, again, speculation. But, um, but whatever it was, it seems like Mo, uh, Aaron and, and Miriam aren't big fans of her. Some even think it's possible that, that Ethiopian, here's a derogatory term, to criticize her for her dark complexion. Uh, the following verses, though, show us that whatever it was about the wife, that wasn't the real issue. That's what starts it. That's what starts them talking is, uh, hey, do you, you know, you have a problem sometimes. You know, <laughs> maybe it's uh, holiday dinners, you know, or whatever. It's like, she's a terrible host, you know. And, you know, I don't even like her. And she's, she always makes Moses, you know, she, you know, she should tell Moses to be around the family more. Whatever the complaints could be. It starts probably somewhere there about his wife. But then the problem gets bigger. And it's in verse two that we see what it is that they say, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? So the, 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 the question here is meant to tear down Moses. And it's asked with the assumption that Moses was spiritually proud that they, the idea was that Moses arrogantly presented himself as the only spokesman for God in Israel. Though it was presented in the form of a question, it was in fact an attack on the authority of Moses uh, and the God who appointed Moses. What did we say about complaints last week? That the complaints aren't usually just about the thing, the complaints are about what God is doing. And so here they're, they're going, hasn't God spoken through other people? The complaint isn't, oh, that God uses Moses. It's God should use us more. We're being underutilized here. We're being underappreciated here. And Moses gets all the run, you know. Moses is the one that everyone, oh, everyone loves Moses. Like we know who our little brother is, you know. In one sense, the proper answer to their question is no. <laughs> the Lord had not spoken only through Moses. God spoke through Aaron in Exodus chapter 4 and in Exodus chapter 12. Miriam spoke inspired words by God in Exodus 15. On another occasion, in some way, God spoke through the elders of, of Israel in Numbers chapter uh, uh, 11. But in another sense, the answer is yes, that God had only spoken through Moses. God appointed Moses as the foremost leader in Israel and God used Moses as the spokesman to Israel. Aaron and Miriam's problem is that they're kind of saying, hey, we're spiritually gifted too. And God has spoken through us. And so Moses needs to share the place of authority over the congregation with us. Uh, they didn't understand that just being spiritually gifted or being used by God in themselves did not mean that they got to also have the responsibility of leading the people of God. Though they were talented, though they were gifted, though they had whatever they seemed to have, that does not put them right in the same place of being the leader of a nation. You'll notice most of the times that we've had complaints, have the people complained against Aaron and Miriam? We, we don't have record of it. When there's big complaints, who do the people complain to? They complain to Moses. There's this idea in leadership, and it's a good, it's a good uh, idea, that, that those who, who uh, carry the, the burden also get the benefit. And you don't get the benefit unless you carry the burden. And the burden of leadership is not a light burden. So these guys are going, we want like the positive parts that Moses gets. He can keep all the complaints. We don't really want that part. We just want authority. 
We want to be able to like, we want, we want people to like pause when we walk through town too. We want people to, to look at us and, and, and see that we're just as special as he is. And so when they say, has he not spoken through us also? So, so in one sense, it's, it's a strange question. We know that God had spoken through them in times past, but the real question was that they wanted more authority and attention. And I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when it talks about gifts in the body of Christ. And there's that part in, in chapter 12 where, where someone would say, it's, when he's talking about the body, he says that some would say, I'm not a hand, so I'm not a part of the body. Is it not a part of the body? No, of course it's a part of the body. But the hand starts going, yeah, but, you know, I never really get to talk. And, and I don't really ever get to taste food. You know, and I, I wish I was, I, you know, the mouth has the best part. Well, you know, that's debatable, number one, because the whole body has to work together. But even if the mouth does have a better job, you know, the hand is still very vital in the work, right? You know, oh, oh, oh you know, I, I'm, I'm not this or I'm not that. Their problem is that they can't appreciate where God has placed them within the body. And I don't know about you, but I, I've done this, that there have been times in my life that I'm like, I'm not happy with the position, Lord, that you have me in. I've told this story a hundred times, but I'll tell it again. I remember I used to serve with a guy in youth ministry real early on in me serving the Lord. And this guy was just like the most gifted guy. He was so good at everything. Like he, he was a, a gifted teacher and communicator. He was a really amazing worship leader. He knew how to administrate. He knew how to, how to like run events. And he, and he was just, he was so good at so many things. And I remember always being so jealous because the first thing I knew how to do as a Christian, I knew I had the gift of helps. I'm like, I know I could set up chairs straight, but that's about it. And everyone thinks this guy's so cool and so hip. That was the other thing. He was like super cool, trendy, whatever, you know, dressed cool. And, I'm, and, and, and I, I had to come to this realization that I'm like, I'm just not as cool as him. And I'm just not as gifted as him. But that doesn't mean I'm not a part of the body. It means that God has placed me in a certain place and he's placed him in another place. But we're both needed. And then I remember, you know, he had moved on and then I, I was in charge of the youth ministry and then a new guy started helping in the youth ministry and I'm like, this guy's way cooler than me and all the kids are going to like him more than they like me. And so for a while, I kind of kept him at an arm's distance uh, going, I don't want him to help too much with the youth ministry because he's cooler than I am. He's going to be, he's better. All the kids are going to want to ride in his car all the time. They're going to think he's the coolest one. And so he's going to get all the cool things and I'm just going to get the complaints, which is about how it happened. But I remember the Lord showing me that it's like, no, he has gifts that you don't have and you have gifts that he doesn't have. And we became these, just these great friends because he's like, I don't want to do what you do. I don't want that part. I just want to do what God's called me to do. That's the way this should have been working here is that these gifts should have worked together and not separate where these people are going. Because you know what they could do if they're really feeling this way? Go lead your own country then. If you don't want to follow the way God has said, I, God has made it pretty clear at this point in time that Moses is the leader. And if they don't want to do it that way and they want to go to a different land of milk and honey, which there's not, if they want to go somewhere else, then go ahead and lead some people somewhere else and see if anyone follows. But chances are most people are going to stick around because, because God has called Moses to be the leader. So here's what's happening. By God's design, Moses had the singular position of leadership over Israel. The, the people were not led. I like how Dave Guzik says this, were not led by Congress or committee. Can you, can you imagine how long it would have taken to get out of Egypt if they had to committee this thing? You ever been on committees? They're terrible. They're great for starting to gather information, that kind of, but when it's time to start moving and everyone has an equal say, my goodness, this is what it usually looks like. You know what it looks like? If you've ever thought what you're going to eat after church on a Sunday. You get like three or four people together and you start committing this thing. Go, where should we eat? It's like, oh, I feel like pizza. I had pizza last week. Oh, okay. Well, then what do you want to eat? Well, I don't know what I want to eat. I just know I don't want pizza. And then everyone's talking and going. And before you know it, it's like, we went to downtown last week. We went there already. I don't feel like that. I'm trying to eat healthier. And all of a sudden you're committing this thing and no one's going anywhere. And it's already 45 minutes after church. And finally, what needs to happen? Someone who doesn't care as much about being liked says, this is where we're going. And everyone usually goes, 
yeah, all right, I'll find something there, you know. <laughs> Why? Because you kind of need a leader. So you can imagine when you got a nation this big, God has said, I'm, I'm choosing one guy to lead it. He's going to lead it. He's going to listen to me and he's going to lead it. So that's what's happening. Verse two tells us at the end, it says, and the Lord heard it. Well, of course he heard it. God knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He hears the secret things we say. The suggestion here is that he heard it and he didn't like it. Verse three talks about Moses' humility. Uh, it's important to see that Moses didn't start out as a humblest man on the earth. We know that <laughs> you know, being raised as, as, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, uh, things were going good for him. It was only after his time in exile, those next 40 years of his life in the wilderness, that he learned that he was nobody. You remember that, right? The first 40 years of Moses' life, he became a somebody, learned what it meant to be a somebody. The next 40 years of his life, he learned what it meant to be a nobody. And in these last 40 years of his life, do you remember what we said? He's learning that God can do something with nothing, right? That he could take a nobody and do something special. And so that's what's happening here. And you remember, Moses isn't just this really proud and arrogant man. Last chapter, he's like, God, I can't lead these people. I can't do this. Just kill me. I can't do this. These aren't, I didn't, I didn't birth these people. So if there's any pride here, it seems to be on the part of Miriam and Aaron. And Moses seems to do what's best here by not immediately defending himself, but he trusts the Lord to deal with the complaint. As a leader, many will complain. And it's best to trust the Lord to fight for us. Moses had seen God fight for them already. Do you remember way back when they're getting out of Egypt? He says like, hold your peace, Moses. That means be quiet and watch the salvation of the Lord and watch God will fight for you. And so here it might not be the same thing that Pharaoh's against him or all the people are against him, but I'm going to guess it probably hurts just as much, if not more, that the people closest to him are complaining against him. And he does the same thing. He just trusts the Lord. This is real important. I, I know sometimes we always just want to defend ourselves. Uh, you know, we can't stand to be misrepresented or have somebody say something that, that's, that's, you know, untrue about us. And the reality is we can't fight every fire. And sometimes it's just best to go, I'm going to trust this in the Lord's hands. So Moses doesn't seem to do anything about it. We don't know how long the complaining lasted. We don't know how long it was going. We don't know how, how intense that onslaught was. But all we know is that, is that what, what, as Moses waited... God heard it. And so then in verse four, it says, suddenly the Lord, verses four through eight, suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, come out you three to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And so here, here's what's, I love this part. The Lord calls out to the three of them. He goes, hey, you three. I don't know where they are. I don't know how the complaints were happening. We don't know, but he goes, come over to the tabernacle. All right, this could mean anything at this point. This could mean anything. And Moses being the humble guy that he is, I can imagine he's going, sure, we want to start sharing responsibilities. Fine, I don't have a problem with that. We'll go to the tabernacle. Maybe, maybe at this point, Maybe at this point, God will decide that it's Aaron's turn to be in charge. Or maybe the three of us together are going to do this. Okay, so they walk over uh, uh, to the tabernacle, calls the three of them there, and they go, it says. And remember, the, the basis of the complaint is, you know, what's so special about Moses? And God's going to explain right now what's so special about Moses. God comes down, stands there, and then he calls uh, Aaron and Miriam. And they both go forward. So, so you can imagine how this feels. That the three of them come to the tabernacle. And then God goes, Moses, you stay right there. You too, come here. Now we know there's a problem. Now they know there's a problem. And again, maybe Moses is still like, I guess they're in charge now. Maybe God's going to fill them with his spirit. Maybe God's going to do a special thing here. I'm sure it was a little more unsettling for them. As they're standing there going... Like Moses kind of been on the right side of just about everything so far. And now here we are separate from him. I'll bet you at this mo uh, moment, Aaron's probably thinking, I should have stopped this. I should have nipped it in the bud. 
because this has been his problem a couple times now, that he has not been able to stand up in the midst of somebody saying something against what God would want. Because this is what, exactly the way it went down when, when the people complained to him about what are we going to do? Where's Moses? And he goes, well, I'll just give you what you want. Here, he's party to this complaint started. And, and again, and we're going to tell you, tell us why. Mo, Miriam's the one that gets leprosy, right? That's how we have a pretty good idea. The, the, the chapter started, you know, in the feminine language. And then she's the one that gets punished. She's the one who starts this. He didn't know how to say, let's not do this right now. Let's not talk. You know the best way to stop gossip? You know the best way to stop division is to go, hey, we're not going to hear that right now. Hey, we're not going to talk about that. I like what Damien Kyle calls this. Uh, He calls it like the whisper ministry. Or, 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 Or then these whisper meetings. Where it's like, we certainly wouldn't say this out loud in front of everybody. We certainly wouldn't say it in front of Moses. But, um, but this, yeah. like Aaron, have you noticed this type of thing? Have you noticed that this is the deal right here? And, 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 and they're complaining against the leader that God has anointed over the nation. And it would have been a lot better if Aaron would have said, wait a second. Mm, God's done something special with Moses. Um, Again, he should have known after the golden calf and Moses grinds that thing into powder and makes everyone drink the water, right? You, you remember Moses got pretty serious about that and God was pretty serious about that and, and 3,000 people died, right? That Aaron should have had the sobriety to say like, let's trust the Lord instead on this, Miriam. I get it, you're probably not happy, but let's leave it. I'll bet you right now he's wishing he would have done that. Because now all of a sudden they're standing separately. And so God explains real quick. He goes, now look, he says, hear my words. Verse six, if if there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision and I speak to him in a dream. Okay, that makes sense, right? That if God wants to get a message through a prophet, he'll give him a vision, he'll give him a dream. He says, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, not in dark sayings. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Oh boy. Oh boy. (laughs) What God's saying is, Moses ain't some ordinary prophet here. This guy, he might be your brother and you've known him since he was in diapers. But he's my servant. Before he's your brother, he's my servant. Right? There's, some, there's something special to that thing where God's going, the family line, that's not even the thing anymore. This guy's my guy who I've chosen to lead this nation right now. And you're speaking against him. When he says that he speaks to him face to face, he's talking about Moses is not just a prophet. He has a way closer relationship, way closer communion, way closer communication to the Lord. And that phrase face to face, it means, uh, it means a great and unhindered closeness in relationship. We, we know it doesn't mean he literally sees the face of God. We know that God is spirit. You can't see him face to face. God said in Exodus 33, you cannot see my face um, as you see the face of a man and live. You can't see God's face and live. But we remember when, when, when Moses said, I want to see your glory, God says, I'll let you see my goodness. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll pass over. I'll put my hand over there. And when I go, you can like jump up and see, you know, my form as I pass by. That's the most that he's gotten to see, but that's more than anyone else has gotten to see. He says too, he says, he is faithful in all my house. I love that. Because he, he says, it's not so with my servant Moses, right? I speak to him face to face. I don't speak to him in dark saints, but he goes, he's faithful in all my house. What does that mean? He's loyal to God. He, he's, he's my guy. And we've talked about faithfulness before. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says this of stewardship, right? He says, we're stewards of the mystery of God. And he says, it's required in stewards that one be found, what? Faithful. 
that you want a servant, you want a steward to be faithful. And what God desires in his people is they be faithful to him. It, w- Moses wasn't chosen because of his great ability, because of his talent, because of his speech, because of that warrior mentality he might've had or because of his leadership skill. It was because he was faithful and someone who could be faithful to the Lord. And that is what the Lord is looking for in his servants even today, is faithfulness to him. I like to remind myself as I'm kind of like in the midpoint of my life here, right? Moses says in the Psalms, right? That the years of man are 70 and if by reason of strength, they're 80. So I'm, I'm gonna be turning 40 soon. I, I'm, I'm at halftime right now, right? And I'm coming to realize something that, that was there in the second quarter a lot, right? When I had this zeal to go and serve the Lord and I've seen it in guys who are in the last quarter of their life, right? You know, think of, you know, well, Pastor Zeke's definitely in the fourth quarter, right? Uh, if 80 is that number, right? It's probably 70 for most of us. But anyways, if we've got the bonus time and we live to 80, right? Most of us are on, we're in the second half, okay? But one of the things I'm seeing is that there's this desire, oh, it's always gotta be young people or maybe old people wanna hold on to things. But, but what I've come to realize is that serving the Lord It's not an old man's game and it's not a young man's game. It's a faithful man's game. That that's what we're looking for. That's what God is looking for is for men and women who are faithful to him. What what is it? It's in Chronicles. It says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. That's what God's looking for is hearts that are loyal to him. God asked them, why were you not afraid? to speak against my servant. As much as Miriam and Aaron didn't want to recognize it, God did have a very unique calling on Moses' life. And, and, And God had equipped him in a special way. And again, before he's their brother, he's God's servant and he's the leader of this nation. And it's not that Moses is beyond criticism. Moses was not to be simply obeyed and praised and never held accountable for any of his decisions. In fact, we remember in Exodus chapter 18, Jethro comes and humbly tells Moses, hey, you're going to burn yourself out. What you're doing is not good. It's not good for you. It's not good for the people. You need to get some helpers around here as it comes to judging the nation. So it's not like Moses is above ever making a mistake. The problem is, is that they weren't afraid to speak against God's servant. And so it's, and they should have been afraid to speak because their criticism here, it's, it's petty. It's something that didn't matter. It was beyond the control because the first thing that their, their, their problem is, is with his wife. The next thing that, that they should have been uh, afraid to speak against Moses was, was because it just wasn't true. Moses wasn't this proud guy. And again, I, I have a feeling with Moses that had God raised up someone else after a year's time and go, hey, you know what, Moses, someone else is going to lead now. I'd go, perfect. I'd love to go to bed earlier. I'd love to not wake, be the first one up in the morning. I'd love to not worry as much about what's going on. You want Joshua to start leading now? (laughs) Be my guest. I'll be the best assistant he's got because he's a humble man. And last, they, they should have been afraid to speak against Moses because their criticism was prompted. And here's the key by their own self interest. They were jealous of the attention that Moses was receiving and they wanted some of it for their self, for themselves. Leaders in the house of God must be held to account. They must be open to criticism and even, and even to questioning. So it's not that, it, you know, there's this idea, you know, and we see it later with David uh, when, he, when he says, I won't raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. And so all the time we're like, oh, if they're, if they're, you know, in charge, we should never complain against them. You know, Pastor Zeke, you know, myself, Pastor Jacob, as we lead this church, the board of this church, we're not above people, you know, being critical of what we've done. And, and I'll tell you, we do our best to make sure any position we take, we could defend it with the scriptures and that we're standing on sure ground. But that doesn't mean that there's not going to be a question and, and, and going, hey, I don't think you should have done it that way. And we're more than happy to, to explain why we've come to that. And, then, and there are some like this that bring those things with the wrong kind of attitude behind it. 
And, and I don't want this to be like self-serving in any way. Like, guys, anytime you challenge me, you're really challenging God. That's not what I'm saying at all. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I have to check my own heart that when there are complaints about things or, or when I want to kind of, you know, lead my own way or do my own thing to go, Lord, check my heart before anything else here. See, that would have been the best part if Miriam would have had this thing that she's like, you know, why is Moses the only one? Before she ever told uh, Aaron, if she would have asked God, like God, you know, like in Psalm 139, what David does, like search my heart, oh God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. And if God would have said, hey, this is actually more your own selfishness than anything else, she could have gone, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. For us, we could do that right? That, that maybe there's a problem. You know, why does so-and-so get to, you know, be in charge of that? Why does so-and-so get this? Why don't I get this? You know, it's like, go sit with the Lord with that first. Sit with the Lord with that. Why don't I get to, and so often when I have a little bit of that and I start qu- asking those questions and I take it to the Lord, the Lord goes, there's a lot of me in there, Daniel. There's a lot of me in that question. There's a lot of like, what is this for you? And I'm like, you're right, God, I'm going to shut up. And that's usually the best thing you can do. Instead of taking it any further or then including other people in it. And, and before you know, because people are nice, right? They're going to go, yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, let's jump alongside that. It, it takes a really spe- special person uh, uh, to be like the prophet Nathan and go, you're wrong. And this is wrong in God's eyes. I praise God for the, for the wonderful people I have in my life who, who when I can have a complaint, they'll go, hey, I'm going to listen to you, finish your complaint, but I'm also going to tell you right your, when you're done that this is stupid. Like, sure, you need to get it out. You need to complain, no problem, but it stops right here. I'm so grateful for people in my life who do that with me. For people who will tell me that I'm being a knucklehead and people who will tell me that the things that I'm saying are not pleasing to God. Right? I, I, have, I have some other friends that they're like, look, we get it. There's times that life's not easy and you gotta, you gotta complain. Okay, sure. But I love that these friends will go, okay, let's stop now. And let's not put any more oxygen on this fire. And let's just let it go out. And let's put it away and let's not talk about it again. I'm like, dang, you're right. And praise the Lord that when other people have brought those things to me, I can go, hey, that's cool. I'll let you complain. But we're going to be done with it right now. And that's what Aaron should have done with Miriam. And all this could have been avoided says, so the anger of the Lord was aroused against them and he departed. After making his anger evident, uh, the remarkable presence of God departed. This left an extremely uncomfortable uh, pause for these guys. And, and, and it, whew. it says, and then when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, a, a suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam and there she was. She's a leper. And in verse 11, it says that Aaron said to Moses, now, <laughs> talk about a change of tune here. He says, oh, my Lord, <laughs> lowercase Lord, right? He's just, he's, he's, he's uh, like honoring the authority that Moses has. He says, my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we've done foolishly, foolishly and in which we have sinned. Do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. He goes, oh man, because we know leprosy is basically a death sentence here. Where does Miriam have to go now? Oh, it was spelled out very clearly in Leviticus and earlier in Numbers now, wasn't it? She's got to go outside the camp. It doesn't matter that she's Moses' big sister. She doesn't get to just use her last name here and go, even though I'm really sinful, even though I'm real like, like should be put out of the camp, Moses is going to follow what the rules say. And it's like, see ya. You got to go out there with all the other people with leprosy outside the camp. The leprosy outside on Miriam is a picture of what she was inside. That she's past feeling, she's numb, she's desensitized to the things of God. Remember of leprosy that it starts small, it grows, it moves beyond the surface level, goes deeper and deeper, and then it spreads. That's what was going on in her heart, right? Probably started out with just a little something. A little something at the holidays maybe, you know, right? Like we said earlier. That it was just a problem that she had with, with, with Moses' wife to start out. But then it became bigger and now it's about Moses' leadership and all of it like just snowballs. And now it's a really big problem, all from something that started small in her heart. And so now she has on the outside what that is in the inside, this leprosy. 
And it's going to cause her now to be separated. Uh, and, and here's the other thing. The result of the leprosy is what the Lord would want to prescribe for her behavior. This grumbling and complaining, this division needs to go outside the camp. What she was doing, just like leprosy, was going to start infecting the camp. It was going to start infect be, uh, because, because people love. They love. They, they gravitate towards division, don't they? When they see a little bit of it, they go, oh yeah, I was feeling a little bit of that too. They go attach themselves to it. That if, th- that if these uh, complaints started working their way down into the nation, you're going to have some major division really soon. Right? There's a good scene in Saving Private Ryan, if you remember that movie, where they're, they're going on a mission, and you, it, the mission seems like a pretty difficult mission. And, and, and so the peop- the, these guys are complaining as they're going. And so they, so they ask the captain, hey, how would, you, how would you complain about, or what do you think about this mission? And, and what does he say? He goes, gripes go up. They don't go down. I'm not going to tell you what I think about this. Why? Because as soon as that, those complaints move downward, they're going to infect everything. So before they can, God gives her leprosy and says she's going to go outside the camp. Now, you want to talk about Moses being a humble guy. Aaron turns to him and goes, oh, please don't lay this sin on us. We've done foolishly. We have sinned. Don't let her, don't let this happen, Moses. If you're Moses or I'm Moses, I can tell you how I probably would respond to this. I'd be like, give it at least a month before I talk to the Lord about it. Like, I can't believe you do this. Here, we're supposed to be siblings, man. You stab me right in the back. I don't know. Maybe this leprosy is the best thing for her. Who am I to question the Lord? <laughs> oh, I hope my sisters get a chance to watch this. Um, <laughs> but you know, Moses, he has every right to be hurt by this. Doesn't he? These guys challenge him and all of a sudden they want him to be the bigger man. But guess what? He is the bigger man. What does he say? He cries out to the Lord. It doesn't look like he wastes any time. It doesn't look like he goes, I'll think about it. He goes, Lord, he says, please heal her. Oh God, I pray. The same person who's ready to lead a rebellion against him, basically, he goes, Lord, heal her. Where do we see this? Doesn't this sound so much like Jesus? That as he's on the cross being ridiculed, and what does he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I'll bet that same heart is in Moses as he has been close to who God is. He's been closer to God than anyone that we've seen so far uh, uh, in history. Well, maybe Adam was probably closer, but after Adam, he's the closest. And he goes, heal her, Lord, I pray. The Lord says to Moses, this is an odd, uh, it's an odd verse in verse 14. If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days and afterwards she may be received again. It's a cultural thing. Um, we know that women had very little rights, if any, uh, in this day. Um, but so so uh, to spit in someone's face is, um, is a real problem. Right. It's like it's like the, 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 the greatest dishonor you can do to somebody. The idea is um, that 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 had a woman uh, or, or any person in the family, but specifically a woman brought shame on a family. That it wouldn't be uncommon for a dad to dishonor her back for dishonoring the family. And then she would be unclean and she'd have to stay away for seven days until she could be made clean again. So that's why he said that, you know, even if her dad had spit in her face here, you know, um, she, she'd, be, she'd be left out for seven days. So he goes, she's going to at least stay out of the camp seven days, Moses. I'll heal her, but she still is gonna, she's still going to go on time out here. It, it, and again, it seems. It, it doesn't say that the leprosy was, um, was uh, not healed right away. It, so it could, be, it could be both. It could be that she did have leprosy for those seven days. It could be that God healed her but said, you're still going to go out there. Uh, we don't know. It says Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days. The people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. And so afterward, the people moved from Hazroth and they camped in the wilderness of Paran. So the main thing again, guys, that no matter where you are, that we need to learn contentment 
in who God is and what God's doing and what God has decided. We saw last week that it was the people who complain. Here it's the leaders who complain. Wherever God's put you, wherever you are in, in that structure, right? Whether it's, whether it's just within your household, whether it's within a ministry, what, what, wherever it is, honor the Lord. Let's honor the Lord with our attitudes. Let's honor the Lord with our words, right? Let's honor the Lord with our actions. And let's be content in what he has said and what he's given. Father, we thank you for, for who you are. Lord, it's a difficult lesson uh, today. Uh, Lord, I know sometimes my complaints can go further than they need to. And so I'd ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I'm sure uh, my brothers and sisters, Lord, some of, some of them are in the same place, Lord, that maybe some complaints have gone further than they should have. Uh, some of the, of the discontentment in, in where you've placed them. Um, Lord, certainly you hear it. We pray that you'd help us to not let too many others hear it. And really, Lord, to let none of, no others hear it. Lord, give us those good friends who would help us nip this stuff in the bud to go, well, that's not going to go any further. Okay, I'll hear your complaint, but let's pray and let's trust the Lord. Lord, we, we, we want to be like that. And so fill us with your spirit, God. We, we do have something that it doesn't seem like Moses, uh, excuse me, that, that Aaron and Miriam had, Lord, and that's, that's access to your Holy Spirit. You say you give us power to, to live this Christian life. And so, uh, Lord, give us the power to say no to ourselves, to say no to our flesh, uh, to say no uh, to, to the complaints, God. So go before us uh, the rest of this evening, Lord, whether we stay in fellowship, whether we have to take off pretty quickly, uh, Lord, whatever it is that we do, Lord, would you be with us? We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand for this last song?